<laughs> okay, hello and welcome to another episode of the Two Stewards Show. My name's Mark and I'm here with Brent. Hello, everybody. And we're going to talk about tenant screening. We uh, mentioned this in an episode tenant previous. Tenant screaming? Screaming. Oh. Sometimes tenant screening leads to tenant screaming. Yeah. But, um, what about landlord screaming? After, the, <laughs> after you do improper tenant screening. <laughs> then there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of screaming both ways. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, you are primarily into long-term rentals, and as such, you do a lot of um, a lot of applications, a lot of rental ads, and a lot of screening. So yeah, why don't we uh, we talk about that a little bit? Just some practical stuff. We talked about uh, young people getting into the market and touched on uh, tenant screening. Yeah, but uh, like it's a it's a bit of an art, right? There's a whole a whole science. I don't know. Is it a science or an art? <laughs> Are you a scientist or an artist? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. But I know that this applies not just to young people because we've heard a lot in the last little while, especially um, people from all different ages, just in conversation, talking about rental properties. And the the, the comment always comes up like, you know, there's this fear of, um, renting out your house or mm -hmm. creating a rental property and, uh, trying to get good tenants is probably the biggest, um, part of that. Or like, how do you know if these people are good and, uh, that you're not going to run into problems. And a lot of people are saying that to me, I don't know, you probably get the same sort of thing. Like that's a skepticism that I think a lot of people have. Yeah. Um, because I think it comes out of like, if I'm going to buy a house, I have certain standards. Like I want this house to be what I would want to live in or like I want um, I want to come back here in five years ten years and I want it to look the same um, you know I don't want things to be damaged I don't want it to deteriorate um, so then they think about who am I gonna put in it and they're like oh I don't know like <laughs> that guy no I don't know that guy and then you know and then they just forget the whole thing like why would yeah. I even bother trying to find tenants it's gonna be too much of a hassle well, the, the current climate in um, Ontario, anyways, is like lends itself to that, right? There's so many horror stories out there now, and especially since COVID, when you yeah. had that whole like "don't pay rent" uh, idea or movement, stop okay. stop paying rent, um, and then landlord tenant board. It's it's minimum, I think, eight months now to get a hearing. Right. So yeah, if you have a tenant who's not paying. You're going to be waiting eight months unless you get some kind of emergency, like safety order or something. But in general, you're so you're going to be. That means you're out rent for eight months because tenants know this. Yeah, and they know that there's not a great likelihood they're going to be judged against, and they're going to have to pay. Um, and if they do, they'll fight it or put it off. So, and this is in the news, right? So this is sort of, everybody is kind of aware of this and they're like, in the back of your head. wow. So I could be out 20 grand easily, 30, 40 grand, you know, when you add damages in, yeah. like, why would I ever want to do this? Um, <laughs> so like, so you said you're going through that now. How often <clears throat> have you had to deal with bad tenants and getting them evicted? Uh, very rarely. This is our first actual eviction process that we're right. going through. Um, we've had a couple other instances with the landlord tenant board. They were brief because the, the situations resolved themselves outside. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, uh, so this, this, this particular story that we're dealing with now is actually a property that we purchased and right. we inherited the tenants. So we weren't able to do any screening. Yep. Um, we weren't able to do any checks on these people. Um, and we are actually, we have b very big plans for this property. So we're, we're hoping to intensify it quite significantly and we need to do significant renovations. So we have a, a very, um, uh, justifiable reason to evict yeah. them. Um, uh, but they are paying the rent. So like, we're not in the situation, like a lot of people find themselves in, in these horror stories where the tenant's not paying, but they're still living there. Yeah. And, uh, you as a landlord kind of have to keep a roof over their heads until you can get a, a legal order to get them out. Yeah. So yeah, that's a, a frustrating situation to be in. I can sympathize with people who are in that cause we're going through the process with the, the board right now, just, um, you know, for the first time going through the whole process and, um, yeah, I, I still think the most, um, easy, 
quick way of getting the tenants out in our situation is going to be to try and help them find a place. And that's what we're actively doing. But cause yeah. like you said, it takes eight months to find a, or to get a hearing at the board. Um, and for those who don't know, maybe the, the landlord tenant board is just, uh, the government organization that, um, like what do you, what, <laughs> well, they, they, they oversee or they yeah. regulate landlord and tenant relations in Ontario yeah. and they have a fair amount of legal power. Exactly. So yeah, when you sign a lease and you give someone the keys and they move into your property, um, ultimately the only way to kind of get them out or to deal with the tenant properly, according to the law is to go through the landlord tenant board. And this, this system has been jammed up with applications and from both sides, uh, presumably landlords and tenants taking to each other to court and, um, yeah, so it's, um, but like, as I was saying, we're, we're trying to get these people out. Um, you know, we're, we're doing some very significant renovations. We're completely changing the use of the property. Yeah. Um, it's not going to be safe for them to live there. Um, like there won't be any water or HVAC or electrical or whatever. Like it's, it's going to be other than that. It'll be okay. Oh yeah. It's a nice piece of land to p- <laughs> pitch a tent for a bit <laughs> aside from the noise and the concrete dust. <clears throat> but, but yeah, we're, we're doing our utmost to try and find them another spot, but it's, it's a tough market to find anything. Right. And these people in particular, they don't have any income like retired. Oh. Like how did they get this rental in the first place? Like who, you know what I mean? It's a yeah. hard, it's a hard situation. You go to apply for something and it's like, well, show me proof of income. It's like, well, we're re- like, I'm retired or, um, you know, where, where's your income source? And uh, that's, that's the first one. thing. It's like, well, how, how do I know <laughs> that you're going to pay the rent? Well, I have investments. It's like, okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that I guess is a situation where we inherited tenants, right? right. And that's something that can be avoided when you're screening tenants. Because yes. a lot of the times, if you're a new landlord and you're buying a property, like uh, unless it's a multi-residential property, like usually if it's a single family home or something smaller, you're going to get a vacant possession, right? Um, like most, most of the time, yeah. like all the properties <laughs> we've, we've bought um, have been vacant. Um, and, uh, and if you have a property already and you're thinking of moving out of it and renting it out or, or something like that, you're going to have vacant possession and you're going to have the task of finding new tenants. Right. But if you're, <laughs> if you're selling a property, yeah, you're selling an investment property, you have tenants in there, obviously it's much better for, uh, for just for sale purposes for future investors yeah. if it's vacant. So how do you, um, I'd be careful how I word this, but how, like, how do you make sure that it's vacant? How do you, if you have tenants in there that are paying the rent, right? And so generally you want it vacant. Like if you're listening, you would want a vacant unit so that you can charge market rent, current rent. Yeah. If somebody's been in there for five years, they could be paying way below market rent. <laughs> and the problem is if you're buying that house, presumably in, in Southern Ontario in five years, the price has gone up quite a bit and that the rent that they're paying will not cover the mortgage. So it's not like... You're just you're not going to buy that house, no. right? And if you're selling it, nobody's going to buy the house because it doesn't make financial sense. Well, the reality is when you're selling a house as a landlord and it's a single family home, like it's very likely that someone could buy it and move in, right? In which case, the tenants have X right. number of time to get out. Like yeah. they 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 have to move out if the new owner is moving in, right? So it's only it's only if it's going to be a rental property and the new owner or their family member is not going to move into the property yep. that the tenant um, could stay. So um, I've never sold. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I haven't had to deal with that, but just putting my, you know, salesperson hat on, I guess, like the seller's hat. If you're going to sell, um, that's a big factor, right? Like if you can get vacant possession for the next uh, investor, um, yeah, that's going to improve your, your chances of selling or your price. Um, but yeah, if you're selling a single family home or even if it's um, like two units, whatever, it, there's a strong likelihood in this market that you're going to have a homeowner buy it and move in. So the tenants have to be aware of that yeah. as well. Right. And that's yeah. what you hear a lot. Like we get a lot of tenant applications from people who were great tenants down the road and then their, the house was sold because the landlord needed the money or whatever. And then, um, you know, the new owner moved in and they needed to find a place and they had, a, not, I guess a couple of weeks, but they had, you know, a couple of months to find a place and then they're out. 
So yeah, I think it's <laughs> is it sixty days notice, sixty or ninety? Yeah, you look that up. Um, I, I yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I guess something else important to note that you know if you're a tenant um, in Ontario, anyways. And like, you know, for most either rent controlled uh, or rent regulated jurisdictions, there's a lot of protections in place for tenants. So um, just because Ontario the house is sold. Yeah. Well, but I'm thinking like New York, California, yeah. um, some of these places as well where they're even, even stricter, right? Just because the house is being sold doesn't mean you have to move, right? Change it. Like if you're in that place, you're in that place. And if the ownership changes, you're still guaranteed to stay in that place. And that's that's why we're talking about like getting it vacant because you know, in a lot of other areas, um, you can just evict people at will. Yeah. Right? Without a like without a reason, just like, yep, I would, you know, yeah, you're, you're out. out. Yeah. Um <clears throat> or the contract is not renewed after a certain period of time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Whereas in Ontario, once your standard twelve month lease is up, it just goes to a month to month with the same conditions and the same protections. All right, for, maybe um, we just chat about that for a quick second because yeah. yeah, in Ontario, like I think it was 2018, they introduced the um, new Ontario standard lease. Mm -hmm. So before that, I guess they had like it was a free for all. You could make up your own lease as a landlord. Yeah. Um, but now, um, more or less, everyone uses the same like in, in terms of residential um, rentals, use the same standard lease form. Yeah. Um, which has helped, I think, clean up a lot of um, confusion and uh, standardize everything so that tenants kind of aware what they're getting into. Landlords, you know, can't pull a fast one on them, I guess. Um, to a certain degree. <laughs> well, I, Mark I, has found some loopholes. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we don't do a lot of uh, long term rentals, yeah. right? Very few. But um, just in speaking with other, with colleagues and other people, like, there are maybe not standard, but there's a lot of addendums that you can add to that lease. And yeah. as long as they don't break the condition, you know, the main conditions of the lease, um, you can add those. And because, uh, yeah, you got to protect yourself as a landlord, right? Yeah. So I know that um, you can even buy packages online. I think uh, Harry Fine is one of the paralegals who has a lot of this uh, stuff where you okay. can just kind of buy that prepackaged thing. And uh, if there's certain things that you want to, you know, exclude or include in the lease or different conditions. Um, there, there is that possibility. It can't contravene yeah. the basic tenant rights yeah. and landlord obligations, but there is a little bit of wiggle room. But yes, the standard Ontario lease is what you're yeah. bound to use, not something handwritten Which, on a like, napkin. If you come up with some clause that you think is great and you want to include it on a, uh, what did you call it, an addendum, I guess, uh, like an appendix or something. Yep. Um, and attach it to a standard lease. Uh, you can do that, but then ultimately you're still governed by the landlord tenant board, right? So yeah, you got to be careful. And so how far you... as there's conflicts or whatever, and yep. I think one thing that we've always had a little bit of uh, questions back and forth about was like, uh, for example, mowing the lawn or snow clearing. Yeah. So snow clearing is a good one because like there's some liability involved. Like as the landlord, as the owner, you're responsible to the city to keep the sidewalk clear, for example. Yep. Right. And you can't in the lease put that responsibility on the tenant because if the tenant doesn't shovel it and someone slips on your sidewalk as a landlord, you're responsible. Yeah. Right. So uh, the landlord has to show that he took effort to clear the, the sidewalk or he has a contract with another company who has insurance who did that. Right. Um, now you can ask them to clear yes. it and you can check that if they cleared it and that's your but you can't force them, right? So then yep. I think there's a little bit of um, confusion over stuff like that in leases where it's like, well, like, can't they just not, um, or can't they just mow the lawn for me? And it's like, well, they can if they agree to and they do it, <laughs> but if they don't, like, and the and somebody calls bylaw and complains, like, who's responsible? It's not the tenant. Yeah, um, and they can change their mind halfway through. Yeah, and they can, yeah. And another one is, uh, another big one is pets. Yes. So I uh, like that's something that we can talk about as we get into screening more, but um like you there's no provision for like not allowing pets. Mm -hmm. So the only way to to not have pets in your unit is to say, Do you have pets? No, okay, well you can rent my place and then, you know, six months later there's three pets in there and you can't do anything about it, right? Yeah. So um 
I, I mean, aside from have a conversation with them, a candid conversation about what we talked about when you moved in, but like in terms of legal action or um, anything that has um, an impact on them changing their behavior, like there's nothing you can do, right? So I, I heard a, <laughs> I saw an interesting example of that, and I'm not endorsing this, but I'm just putting it out there. It's something that another landlord has done is they advertise their units as pet friendly yeah, and find out information about the people's pets. Um, and then they know if that person has pets or not, and then kind of let that guide their decision as to, you know, whether they actually want to be pet friendly or not. So it's a little bit of a, I don't know, I guess a sneaky way of doing it, but, um, just to say yeah, yeah. one way to find out if they ac <laughs> actually have pets and it's because you can lie yeah. with impunity on yeah. a, on an application, right? Yeah. For, for a lot of different things. Yeah, those little, so, I guess, seemingly little things. But I think if, if somebody's already scared about uh, getting good tenants and scared about property damage and, like, why do I want to get into this? Pets is another thing that adds to the list, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, man, they're like, it's going to just damage the trim or whatever. And, like, the floors are going to get all ruined um, and cleanliness and all these different factors, right? Yeah. And that's something well, and I want to avoid. And not to add to the uh, to the fears, but what about? Um, I'm already scared, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> what about additional people moving in? Do you like what oh, are the rules? Yeah, we around actually that? have a situation mm -hmm. like that right now. So, man, I sound like an expert or something. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, maybe I'm not. <laughs> well, okay, we our situation that we're dealing with is we have we have a lease signed with two or. Yeah, we signed a lease with two individuals. Yeah. So they're, I think they're brothers or friends or something. Um, so they lived in the unit for a year or two, uh, and they were both on the lease. They both paid me half the rent. And then the one guy said, oh, I, I want to go over here. So he moved out, yep. and I said, okay, well, what are we going to do? And then he, the other guy said, well, I have a friend who can move in. So I said, okay, let's screen him, and we'll yep. get him in there. And he'll sign a new lease, and you guys both sign, and... So we had the rent I think it increased a little bit because it was the end of their lease term uh, and they both signed and then um, and now the other guy's moving out. So now the, the, <laughs> the other guy's so moving out. A and, moved out, now B moved out and you're left with C. Yeah, now I'm left with C uh, and now I, I, yeah, I, I'm dealing with a situation where like um, if I continue to rent to this person, he's responsible. He's the only one on the lease now. Yep. So he's responsible for the full rent payment, yeah. but he only really agreed to pay half when he came in, right? Like he can't afford, we screened him as if he could yeah, like, yeah pay half, pay half, right? Um, because both names are on the lease, but now if he can't, he's got to get out. Um, so according to uh, some of these guys on the chat that we have, which is really good, actually, these guys yeah. are great. Um, there's different options. I guess we could we could find someone else and screen them but at the minute we sign a new lease with them, now you just the other keep guy rolling it out, over, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, it's not an ideal situation because, like, I don't, I don't usually do room rentals where you have different people who don't yeah. know each other renting a room, and I don't, I don't, uh, I don't want to get into that. I don't find that to be a long-term, very sustainable solution, um, and it requires a lot more management of personalities and whatnot. So. Um, so in this case, uh, some of the suggestions that were made is you could basically let this current tenant stay if he wants to, and he could find someone else to live with him to pay him half, but I have to collect the rent directly from yep. him, right? Rather than both. Um, and as long as I do that, and then this guy moves out, then the other guy has to move out as well because he doesn't have a lease and he's not paying me rent. Yeah. So uh, yeah, there's different interesting ways to go about dealing with multiple people and people moving in like we have had other tenants who have had people move in and generally we we uh, do a little bit of screening when that happens just to make sure like we know who they are yeah and a lot of the times it is temporary so we have had it yeah like you know friends in the area for like you know a month or two and then they want to stay here well yeah like go ahead you know like yeah but i gotta say like our tenants overall are great tenants like yeah. even these people too like just yeah i have no complaints and they're they're awesome so but that comes from good screening <laughs> it does <laughs> and it let me does. tell you about that <laughs> <laughs> 
But uh, w- yeah, one thing that uh, a lot of landlords, I guess, don't realize is that like tenants can move people in. Yeah, yeah, you can. And as stop long as it. they don't exceed this, you know, people per square foot or people per How many bedroom. People per square foot? Can we do uh, two people per square foot? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's more than you think. Yeah. Right. Um, but I guess the important thing, like in that situation, you can't do much about it, but do not ever accept rent right. from anybody other than the leaseholder. Because right. the minute you accept yeah. rent or communicate with them about the rental situation, um, that basically constitutes Implies. you accepting them as a tenant. Yeah. And now you could be stuck with the same yeah. situation. Like you could be stuck with tenants that you never agreed to. Yeah. That you didn't screen yeah. because they just moved in and uh, they could be bad tenants. Yeah, your relationship with them, if you don't want them to be your tenants, should be like they're just your tenants' friends who are crashing on their couch kind yeah. of thing. Like yeah. we don't ever talk to you, to them about this and there's no business yeah. agreement here. Yeah, okay, that's, um, that's a good thing to highlight. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about like before we even get to this is like, yeah Um, screening tenants is important but um i think if you're getting into this for the first time like you do have an opportunity to try and find a good place and um my number one question to ask people is like would you live in this unit right because um uh prospective landlords you mean yeah prospective landlords so like if you're if you want to be a landlord you want to invest or you want to or you have a property already and you're like i'll just rent this out like wouldn't that be great and yeah, I always ask people like, would you live here? Like you and your high standards and like, you know, you want to drive a nice car and live in this really comfortable home and like, would you live in this? And uh, if they say no, and I, I had people who have blatantly told me, no, I wouldn't live in this unit. Yep. And that's a funny story, but it's like, okay, then who do you think would, right? And uh-huh. uh and the answer to that question is usually <laughs> the wrong person or the person who ends up in the horror story yeah. uh, on the news, right? And that seems obvious, I think, but uh, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's not. No, it's a common, <laughs> common attitude. You're right. Yeah. Well, because it's almost like, do I really have to do more work than this? Like, it's a roof over a head. It's a parking spot and a front door. Like, what, what, what do you else want? do you need? Yeah. yeah. Like, the, the toilet flushes for now anyways. And, like, <laughs> whatever, right? And, like, where's the standard? And, yeah, it, it that doesn't bode well for a landlord getting into it. And for the long-term um, impacts of your investment, right? Like, yeah. if you're, if you're going to hold this for any significant time, you're going to be dealing with some issues when that that type of attitude is used yeah so you're you're saying before if you're want to be a landlord if you want to do investment you need to you need to do a lot of thinking and figuring before you even buy a place yeah i guess about like your ideal tenant and will that place sustain that tenant yeah like how do you kind of walk through that with clients Oh man, if the places sustain the tenants on their own and you didn't have to do any work, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think I said this before, but it probably is good to repeat just uh, like good home, good area, good tenant. Like it's, it, it's almost like too simple. And, yeah. um, but it's very true that like if you're going to f- try to look for a property that you want to own for the long term and deal with good people, like you just find a good property in a good area like it's what if you can't afford a good property well in a good then area? get a partner and get her done like <laughs> so we, okay well, you're or, saying or you can you can make you can make improvements to properties that are poor properties or you can yeah like but that's the ideal right so you want that if you're going to sacrifice one of those things like generally the tenant's going to be not what you expected either right like if you're going to do a poor area yep. or like a, a not very desirable place to live, maybe it's unsafe. Uh, like maybe there's more crime. Maybe there's no good schools in the area. Maybe there's no amenities close by. Like, well then who wants to live there? Um, are those people who have a good job? Are they ones who are stable in their income and their family situation? Like, do they have, um, you know, do they have the ability to pay the rent and are they responsible enough to maintain certain things about the property that you know you would expect as a landlord 
right? And if you start sacrificing on the, the quality of the area and the quality of the home itself, or you, you buy a poorly uh, constructed home and you maybe improve it, right? Um, but if you sacrifice on those things, your tenant quality is going to suffer as well, right? So I think that's a no-brainer. No? Uh, well, it is, but it kind of answers that, that question like, okay, I have X amount of money, so this is yeah. all I can afford. Like it's a lousy home in a lousy area. Yeah. But like you said, people need somewhere to live. And like, yeah. what do you want? You got yeah. a, a roof, you got a <laughs> toilet, et cetera, et cetera. But people don't really consider sort of the longer term implications. Like if you could just be throwing your money away, essentially, right? Yeah. Like, like if you do if, get in a situation where there's property repairs that need to be done, yep. right? And you don't have the money because the tenant's not paying or they're not paying very much because they can't afford or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, then you know, you're not making the repairs to the property and the property's degrading over time and it's getting worse every year. And now you got to fix the roof on this house. That's not making you any money and it's costing you money. Right. And that's the stories that I hear time and again too, is like the spiral down of like, you know, I didn't make that repair. So the tenant didn't appreciate it. So the tenant did this and then that broke and then this, and then eventually they weren't paying me and the whole thing. And I just sold it. Yeah. Or I I kicked them out (laughs) or they left Yeah, and I got another tenant who was even worse than the first one because the place is such a dump. And yeah. like, well, I didn't have any money left to fix it up. And yeah. yeah. So if you're getting into this, you want to start on the other trajectory, right? Where you're actively improving the property. You're actively seeking a good area and trying to improve things and you're responsive to the tenant and they're, yeah, but that comes after, I guess that part kind of comes after tenant screening too. Right. Which is kind of what we wanted to talk about. But. Yeah, but the, the I mean, initially, like the place you buy is kind of going to determine the tenant you're going to be able to, to get. Yeah, right? yeah. If you want an A-plus tenant, like where do A-plus tenants live? C-minus houses? Yeah, C. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. A-plus houses. <laughs> yeah, where where would you live? That's a, like a, a great first thing. And maybe you have low standards and you live in a basement apartment. Um, you know, with one bedroom and no windows and and low ceilings and no ventilation for the stove and you'd be totally fine with that. But, you know, like, yeah, most people prefer to have a little bit more natural light. They want safe, clean air to breathe. They want whatever, like a good means of egress. They want a parking spot, whatever they want, right? You can make a list of all the things that you think that you would want to see in a house. Yeah. And then um, just go down that list and ask yourself, like, objectively like take your own personal opinion out of it and just say look does my property have these features you know and um what are people looking for and that's something that's kind of cool when um like because we're actively in the industry we're always talking to new tenants it's actually pretty cool to meet people like you know every week who are looking for places yeah and you have a list of questions you can ask them about the property specifically like you know why are you interested whatever but then you can also ask like you know have you seen other places what are you looking for yeah what have you seen on the market what are things going for like just and they love to talk a lot of these people right about where they're um where they were at in their search and maybe they saw some other places and you know, they were just horrible and you, yeah. And then they go off on a tangent about that and it, it's interesting to get feedback. Right. And yeah. um, maybe if you're renting something for the first time, like you don't have that experience, but um, there's good questions you can ask to start getting uh, a sense of like, okay, is my property really going to be better than ones on the market or is it going to be the same or is it going to be worse? Like, Right. And then, um, that's a good way to gauge like where you should improve. Um, you know, maybe you're doing the upstairs and you're going to rent the basement later and you can ask the guy upstairs, like, you know, Hey, like, you know, how'd you find this and what, what'd you like about it? And you can make any necessary improvements on the basement. So stuff like that. It's really, yeah. So, yeah. So what I'm gathering here, (laughs) you're talking about a plus tenants and a plus properties. Yeah. So these are not going to be at the lower end of the rental scale, right? And like, is that, I don't know, is that unfair? Those like people who can't pay a lot of money got to live somewhere too, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't think it's fair. No. <laughs> 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 who is responsible for it is another question. And, uh, that one, uh, maybe we should have more podcast <laughs> episodes to try and figure that question out because, um, yeah, I agree. Like, uh, affordability is a massive issue. Like people, it's in the news, obviously, and uh, like 
it's, it's a topic that everybody's concerned about, right? Or mm. everybody says they're concerned about anyways. Um, whether or not something can be done about it or what can be done about it is another question, right? And that's something more uh, for another episode, I think, like macroeconomics. Yeah. What's the main underlying problem here? Yeah. But as far as responsibility goes, like a landlord, like if you're going to rent a property out, uh, you have to be able to buy the property. So you have yep. to be able to afford it. Right. And if you, if you have full intentions of being the best landlord ever, and you're going to buy a property, you're going to rent it to great tenants and you're going to take care of this thing. You're going to be there every time there's an issue, you're going to do proactive maintenance and, um, you know, everything you can to make sure that this goes well, there's costs, right? Like you got to buy the property. Yep. So what's it cost to buy a property? And then you're going to have to maintain it. So there's costs to maintain it. Um, and all those costs gets passed on to the tenants. So the type of tenants who can afford whatever you buy and want to maintain, um, that's, that's essentially like, it's a math equation at that point, right? It's like, yeah. what can you afford? <clears throat> and we can talk about this a little bit more in screening, but like we generally look for, um, like income from the tenants, uh, to be, you know, one third of the rent. So if you take their gross, which is tough, which is tough. And like, sometimes they'll go over a little bit, but basically that means like if the tenants combined make, um, a hundred, 120 grand, let's say, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, a family moves in and they make 120 grand as a household income, then we want, uh, one third of that. What's that? 40,000, 40 grand. Yeah. As their max rent spend. So gross rent. What's that divided by monthly? That's probably a pretty decent rent payment. <laughs> uh, it's 3,300 bucks a month. Yeah, 33. Yeah. So, but that's not out of line for a whole house in no. our area. Like no. if you go online right now and you look for a full house for a family, um, you know, you'll be spending 3,000 to 4,000 depending where it is, right? Like you can find houses in um, nicer neighborhoods that are even more like, yeah. Um, and then if you start getting into fully furnished and whatever else, so that's generally what we say, right. For tenants who, um, who want to rent a unit, it's just a math equation when it comes to the income side of things, right. It's like, if you have, um, you know, good enough income, we don't want to overburden somebody, right. Like we don't want them to spend 50 or 60 or 70% of their income yeah. on rent. Like that doesn't bode well for them or us. Like, and we are totally upfront with people when they say, <clears throat> you know, Hey, this is my income. It's like, in all honesty, I don't want to put you in a bad financial situation. Yeah. This is not the unit that you should rent. Like your, if you fast forward your future from now, like five years from now, like you've given us 60% of your money. Yeah. Right. And you've had this nice place to live, but you know, you're, you're very far behind and, and we, yeah, we don't want to do that. So um, but yeah, then, um, yeah, it essentially is a math equation. Like, is it fair? <laughs> it's a real well, thing. It's not getting easier. It's not getting better. No, I think it's going to get worse. Who's responsible for it. And is it fair? I don't know. Yeah. Cause I've heard <laughs> that, that figure, like that's sort of a common, a common number, right? A third of, uh, gross. You know, yeah. A third of gross towards rent. And like, it's just, um, a lot of people have said that's not achievable anymore. Yeah. Uh, and like, I get that because, you know, a three bedroom upper unit in Hamilton is going to go for about 2,500 bucks. Um, so if you do the math, then that means you need to have a household income of about 90 grand. Yeah. Right. Which, you know, you, you may or you may not. Yeah. Um, so, and then if you don't, you're pushing up that sort of debts or not debt service ratio that's mortgages but um, yeah your income to uh, expenses Rent. yeah um but that's like you're making a very good point that you're just you know if you, if you accept that you're potentially putting these people in a bad situation yeah that's something we don't want to do like we all obviously want to have tenants who can afford to pay the rent just for our sake because as landlords like we got to pay the mortgage we want to keep this property up and we want to have a good investment right we want yeah. some return for the risk that we're taking. But, um, on, a, on the same token, like we also don't want to put tenants, um, you know, further behind every year just because they want to live in this particular unit. Um, and it could be, 
um, that tenants are looking around and they're saying, well, like I can't get anything. So I'm just going to start applying to everything. And, yeah. um, I get the sense like, cause I look through our, um, our listings quite frequently and like, you can tell that, you know, this person they've applied before to that unit, uh, you know, two months ago or whatever. Yeah. And we yeah. screened them yeah. and we accepted someone else because their application was very poor and they applied to something that's double the rent or like way more, right? Yeah. Like they were applying for a one bedroom basement apartment. Now they're paying for a three bedroom main floor. <laughs> and it, but it, it's just like, you can't, you can't proceed with, um, with things like that when the math is just like, okay, you're going to be so far behind. Like we yeah. can't do this. Um, and so you, it is sad and it, it's a crisis and I think we should highlight that. Like, I think it's, uh, it's very clear that we're pumping so many people in this country and we have such a housing shortage and it's becoming this crisis situation where like people can't find places to live and they're making do with whatever, like they're living mm -hmm. at other people's houses, they're living with family and like, it's not ideal and uh, it's not what most people want. Right. Yeah. And that's so, you know, that's that common thing, like the, the trope out there that landlords are parasites yeah. Or that landlords are, you know, like feeding off other people and just getting rich at the expense of others. And it's like, you know, it's not the case. And you talk about the housing crisis, right? This is a, a, a macroeconomic trend largely created by the government. And I don't think it should be up to individual landlords to try and fix this crisis by buying lousy properties and charging cheap rent. Because you're yeah. just eventually, like, you know that's going to put you into trouble because you're going to get bad landlords not paying the rent. And, like, that, that doesn't help anybody. And it impoverishes you. As opposed to getting a decent place where you can actually provide rent for someone. Yeah. Um, but, you know, how can you possibly, as an individual, stem the tide of a million people coming to Canada <laughs> last year when we only build houses for a third of them? Like... Well, How can you fix that? I'll you can't. paint a different picture for you too for a second because okay, we Bob have Ross. tenants. Yeah. Oh man, I watched Bob Ross the other day. That guy is great. Yeah. I'm like, I rediscovered. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Bob Ross. But <laughs> I was not feeling well. I was just like, I got. I watched Bob Ross. <laughs> Anyways, what were we talking about? <laughs> Somebody did a time lapse of uh, of all of his paintings, and really? apparently, it's like a journey. Yeah. down a river and like through a wilderness no and way yeah okay i gotta I verify if that's true that. but yeah yeah anyways it, you're, you're gonna paint a picture i of, actually uh, googled amazon uh <laughs> bob ross painting kits because i was like and then they're like 300 bucks oh man but you got to get this almighty easel you know He's oh, the almighty okay. paintbrush and the almighty <laughs> paints and, anyways I was going to paint you a picture of something. What was it again? <laughs> we were talking about uh, landlords <laughs> buying lousy players, you know. How oh, to okay, fix yeah. Their so if crisis. I have, I have tenants. So I, I think it's our first. No, it's not. Yeah. So we have tenants that just uh, sent us notice, say, "Hey, we're going to move out in sixty days," and they're buying a house. Okay. Cool. So how often do you hear? Yeah. Of tenants buying a house. Like that to me is so exciting because like, like these people, I want to say suffered for years, but like they got good jobs. They went to school, they got good jobs and they, they lived whatever. We had a decent market rate for that unit. Uh, they were there for about two and a half years or something like that. And they saved up enough money to buy their own place. And I'm super proud and like super happy for them. Like it's, it's, it's awesome. So like, those situations happen too, right? So it's yeah. not like uh, you're just taking advantage as a landlord, being a parasite on the system, whatever, and uh, and making it rich off of these people. Like we were able to sustain the investment property. We were able to maintain it. We were able to improve certain things about the property. We did the driveway, whatever, resotted some of the yard and whatever. Yeah. So like the property's in great shape. It's going to continue to attract great tenants, but these people were there for two years and you know, they were able to save up and like, it's just such a, a cool thing to have that yeah. sort of situation. Right. And we've had, we've had multiple other people too, as well come through and, you know um, you know, they're building a house or they're buying a house and like, like those situations happen as well. And yeah. you're kind of participating in this, like a stepping stone for them. 
So it is cool um, to hear that side of it too, right? Where it's not just like, you know, hey, we're hosing these people <laughs> and we're making it rich. Out. Like we're not. Yeah. Right. We're paying for what we provide to them. Yeah. And I think maybe we can talk about that a little bit when we talk about your Airbnb stuff too, because you're very much providing a service. Yeah. Right. And I look at it the same way with long-term rentals, like it's a housing service. And I think for these particular people, like they're going to move out. Hopefully they're not listening to this, <laughs> <laughs> but they're going to move out in two months and they're going to become homeowners, yeah. but they've been tenants for their whole, whatever until now. Right. Like they're young people. Like, they didn't mow the lawn or whatever. Like they're going to have a lot of responsibilities to take up and then they're going to go, Oh man, I didn't appreciate that. Like, yeah. the, you know, I have to deal with the roof and the furnace. And like, I think there's a lot of things that they, they might be aware of, but they just, they haven't had the responsibility for. And then yeah. they're going to, it's going to be an eye opening thing. And I think it generally is right. When you go from being a tenant to being a landlord and oh, I've, yeah. I've been a tenant in the past and like, it's great. Oh, yeah. you know, on the weekend, you just do whatever you want. Like you yeah. don't have to do any gardening or do any like repairs or like, you know, your wife doesn't have a long list of tasks that you gotta, <laughs> you know, Hey honey, put the screens in. Hey buddy, take the screens out. Like whatever. Right. It's just, uh, you just text the landlord and you go to the beach. Yeah. And then you come back and it's done. <laughs> yeah. So that's, but that's a service that you provide as a landlord, right? Like you're providing this housing service to them. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, maybe it's not, in our case, it's not fully furnished and all things included. Um, in your case, maybe it is, but um, yeah, it's still a, a service relationship with yeah. them. So. Okay, so we, we talked about um, a bunch of stuff, which maybe doesn't sound like it's exactly related to tenant yeah, screening. Like Bob but Ross? Bob <laughs> Ross. <laughs> um, no, but really, I think if everything we talked about so far is part of tenant screening, right? Getting the right property, getting the right um, place so that you're set up for the right kind of tenants. That probably weeds out at least 50% of the of the, the tenants that you don't want that are going to cause you problems. And like you're, it's, yeah, you're it setting weeds them that out foundation. and it also doesn't attract them, right? Like, well, th that's, uh, yeah. that's what it, you just eliminate yeah. that as a, yeah. as a possibility because yeah. you've built that good foundation for, um, yeah, for the kind of people that you want to attract. And I think that's that's something that people don't, people often miss that part of it because, you know, they're like, oh, I can never find good tenants. It's like, well, why did you buy this property? Yeah. This is why. Yeah. You're like, chances are this property in this part of town, you're never going to find the ideal tenant that yeah. you really want. So yeah. I just can't overstate that enough, right? Yeah. And it's a bit of a fragile thing too because if you do happen to find a good tenant, uh, the likelihood of them moving on or ending their lease early if they find something better is higher, right? Like yes. if I if I rented a place and I'm like, you know, I really don't like this, but I'll stick it out for however long. And then, you know what? Hey, I found something better. I'm out of here. Yeah. Right. And you get a lot uh, different relationship with your tenant when they're kind of like, I'm ready to move at any second and uh, I'm looking actively for something that's better than this. Um, so yeah, that's something you definitely want to avoid. And that like, that comes to the location where you buy and what you yeah. buy and how you, yeah. So anyways, what were we talking about? We're going to talk about the well, actual just, tenant just screening. screening. But my <laughs> point is the place you buy is part of the screening process. And it's probably the most important thing that, that you would do in terms of tenant screening. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because now you just, all of a sudden you've got a different group of applicants, yeah. right? So let's talk. So tenant screening, I think that like there's things you can control and then there's things you can't, right? Yeah. And one of the things like what we just said the biggest thing you can control is what you buy and where you buy it. Right. Yeah. Um, so let's get that out of the way. Now what? Like now you've got this place and it's decent and you want to rent it out. Oh, well, mm -hmm. what do you do? Um, what ooh, do you do? Well, you stand on the roof with a sign. <laughs> 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 rent my, well, yeah, now you're into marketing, right? So yeah. now, uh, you have to go out and try to spread the message. Uh, what's your message? Well, your message is you have a great place to live for a great person mm -hmm. or people. And, you know, uh, 
who who's going to hear your message well like how what platforms are you using to get it out um what not even platform like what avenues like do you put a sign in the front yard um you know do you newspaper ad do you do google ads do you do facebook do you do kijiji or padmap or whatever right so there's there's all kinds of different ways and uh that that i think is something where you can start building experience because um like for us we do it all the time so we kind of have honed in on a bit of a system that works for us and that we're happy with with our particular market and our particular segment in the market yeah um for other people like you know i know for bigger landlords like for example multi-res buildings like you almost don't even have to like you just put it up and like there's a list of people vacancy vacancy yeah Yeah. like vacancy here boom and then you know and, and and our current climate like we talked about with population the way it is like there's just a waiting list of people ready to move in so um we don't have that in particular in like a higher end rental market Mm -hmm. where um because generally people will find a place and then they're out of the market right and then it's not like they're on the waiting list for eight months and then you have a unit available and they move in so okay here's a quick question for you how long is like would you or what's the profile for the length of stay that you want tenants to uh, to be, because like yeah. some people will just be like, "Yep, I want to get a tenant, and hopefully they stay forever." Is yeah. that your attitude, or do you have? What do you think? Um, that used to be more my attitude, and I think the idea was that we get a tenant who's good, we treat him good, and he stays forever, and we're happy. Right. And that was like 2015, <laughs> and then prices went up, and like <laughs> rents went up, and I was like. What am I doing? Um, and now we have a little bit of a different mentality. We're not opposed to having long-term tenants. I think there's good stability in it and um, for the right property and the right mortgage terms and whatever you have going on. Um, yeah. It can make a lot of sense, especially if you're really hands-off and you don't want to be um, you know, uh, involved too much. Um, but our general um, sentiment now is to try to find tenants that are going to be moving out in you know two to three years um max four kind of thing right you know ideally stay for one year if we can get two years that's probably preferred yep um but two to three years is kind of the sweet spot so finding somebody who is um upward mobile i guess yep somebody who is going to go to a different um place they're going to advance their career they're going to buy a house they're going to whatever they're going to do, they have, they're using this house or your rental as a stepping stone in their plan. Right. Right. So that's, uh, and the reason for that is obviously like with rents increasing, like we want to be charging market rents. Um, and that's the easiest, best way to do it. There's a lot of advantages to, to like maintaining, maintaining the property. Um, like we do regular checkups on the property and we do maintenance and stuff on a regular basis, but to have vacant possession of a property, even if it's for a couple of days to yeah. refresh things and to repair things and to make sure that they're good. Um, the more frequent we can do that, like if it's 10 years, like you might be replacing the flooring after three years right? or right. after 10 years. Right. But like, you know, hopefully you can mitigate some of these things every, if you get in there every two, three, four years. So yeah. those sorts of things, um, help a lot as well. So if, and if you getting back to the income thing, if you have somebody who's like at the absolute max of their, of their income, (laughs) they're probably not going to move. Yeah. They're going to stay there. Right. As opposed to someone where it's more comfortable and they're, like you said, upwardly mobile, maybe they're going to buy a house. Yeah. Um, if they're absolutely strapped for cash because they're uh, every 60% of their income is going to rent. Yeah. They're not going to buy a house ever and they're probably never going to leave. Yeah. And we had that when we were renting too, like my wife and I got married, we rented, uh, we ended up renting an apartment building, but we basically picked the cheapest, like within reason, like the cheapest, safest yeah. <laughs> one we could find in an apartment building. It was like, you know, I don't want, if I'm not going to, if I'm going to pay this money in rent, like, and I don't own it, like, you know, I just want to pay the least amount and yeah. have a place to live. And I know that it's a stepping stone, right? I know that I'm not going to be here for 30 years and I'm, I'm saving up money to do something else. Um, so this is a, it's a temporary measure. It's a one to two to three year plan. Um, and so for those, for tenants who treat your units like that, 
that's a good thing, right? Because you're, you're, and it's more of a business relationship. You're, yep. you're providing a housing service to them for a fair price. They're willing to pay you for that price. It's not too much for them to afford, right? Like they have three times the income that they do pay in rent and they're going to buy a house or they're going to do something else in a couple of years. Or they, they eventually want to live in Toronto or where, like yeah. where, wherever it is. Right. Yeah. Um, we've had people to move across the country for jobs and stuff because like they knew they're here for study for a little while, then they want to go over there and, and that's their goal. And like, yeah. and then they want to buy a house to start a family in Alberta or whatever. Right. So, yeah, I don't know what your question was, but <laughs> no, it was yeah. just just related to the income. It was a good, <laughs> yeah, it was a good point. So, okay, can you share with us a little bit about the places you advertise? Is that like a trade secret or yeah, uh... it's a trade secret, Mark? <laughs> you got to invest with good stewards if you want to in on those. <laughs> um, no, well, we can share that um, these things. Like generally, our properties are kind of on the higher end in terms of quality finishes, like location of the property. Um, we just found that to be a niche that we really like being in. Yeah. Like it's worked well for us. I, like it's definitely, there's other ways to profit in real estate and investing. Um, so I wouldn't say it's like the best thing to do, but it definitely, um, has worked well for us. Um, but yeah, as far as, um, tenants go, like the tenants that we have are great as, as a result, right? Like we're spending a lot on finishes, a lot on, um, getting the property from, um, I think we talked about this before, basically turning it from a single family home into, um, multiple units, right? Yeah. So if it's a single family dwelling, we want to turn it into two to three units and those units are going to be perfect. Like from now on, from once we're done with them, they're going to be purpose built rental units. Like they're never going to be somebody's house, somebody's house again. Like yeah. it's just going to be, this is a rental. So if that's a rental unit from now on, until the end of time or until this house falls over like or until the city approves a you know apartment building on our site or something yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the lrt comes through um <laughs> now that probably will never happen right they don't approve lrts very quick <laughs> they just talk about it <laughs> for years um but yeah until that happens like this has to be the best rental unit and attract the best people and people i want to deal with people who are going to stay there for two to three years. And that's kind of the goal of our model that we've, we've honed in on. Right. So I don't know if that answers your question, but no, I want to know where you're advertising. That's what oh, I want to where know. Am I ad- okay. So that's, <laughs> so then once we, uh, yeah, once we have a unit completed or a unit comes vacant, we had to advertise it. And like I've explored so many different avenues with this and we've tried different, um, platforms, different websites, but like Facebook marketplace is probably the, I don't know, where do we get 99% of really eh? 95? Yeah. yeah. Well, so we've got tenants from referrals. Yep. Um, referrals from people in our network, referrals from other tenants. Um, so we have had that a number of times. Um, we've actually had tenants who have moved up in units too. Oh, okay. multiple times where we've had tenants in a basement they get married they want another place we find them a main floor so we've had some great um retention there where you know they can they you know we we think they're great tenants we want to keep them and but their family's growing and they want to yeah. have more space or whatever <clears throat> so we have had that but facebook marketplace in terms of finding new tenants has been probably the best um kijiji a little bit um generally uh, the, the, the listings on Kijiji are a little bit more expensive and, um, we find we get a lot less responses, but you get once in a while you get better quality. Right. Um, so it, it is interesting, like, um, but Facebook seems hands down, like where we're getting most of our stuff okay. and I have a love hate relationship with Facebook, <laughs> with Facebook marketplace, mostly hate, but. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a Christian evil. attitude. Yeah, it's a necessary <laughs> evil. It's not necessarily the greatest uh, tool for uh, from a landlord's perspective, like to to deal with. Right? Is it's kind of a black box. Yeah. And there's a lot of frustrations. Like I just talked to other landlords as well. And yeah, there's not like you can't call up Facebook and say, "Hey, look, I have an issue with this. Like, can you fix it?" Yeah. No. That's right. And like. It's algorithms, right, man? And I, I don't know algorithms very well, but 
what are we at an hour ready with this conversation just about yeah okay well we got we're almost halfway <laughs> <laughs> um you want to know about facebook i want to know okay so yeah Oh, well, okay. So when we list something, um, you, yeah, you post a, a listing on Facebook marketplace, right? Yeah. Um, or you could post it on Kijiji, you post it wherever, but you're posting pictures, you're posting a description of your unit and you're posting some features, benefits of it. And like, whatever, there's a whole checklist of things. Right. And generally what happens is like on a lot of these tools, I don't think Kijiji has it, but, uh, Facebook for sure. And some of these other ones, they'll have like a map tool, right? Where right. your ad, your unit will pop up on an ad on a, on a map where somebody can search. So um, I always try to advise landlords is like, you know, put yourself in a tenant's shoes. They're trying to find a property. Like, what are you typing in? Uh, what are you like? How are you going to find this thing? Right? Are you just going on Google and saying like rentals in Hamilton? Enter. Yeah. Right. Or are you going on Facebook Marketplace and typing in rentals in? whatever right so do those kind of searches to figure out like where do you fall and um okay so when somebody does search that yeah or like yeah exactly um and that it's hard to beat the facebook algorithms and stuff too right like yeah yeah Uh, generally you're speaking you're at their mercy it's like here's my ad you guys promote (laughs) (laughs) um and and things change a lot like it's hard to say hey this is what you should do today because like next week they, they tweak something in the algorithm and you can't have this word in there. And if you yeah. say this, like, you know, and I did notice that too, like we've had ads where you, like you, maybe you say it's a family oriented community, this property is located. And then like something about saying a family is discriminatory or whatever. And right. like you take the word family out and now all of a sudden it's, yeah, it, you can post it, right? It, like it's... so these strange things that it's like, is that racist? Is that sexist? Is that whatever? And is you got to take all the boxes, right? It's got to be the most generic, uh, secular ad you can make yeah. that attracts people. Like it's it's absurd, right? Like it, yeah, I guess you could say it's a safe neighborhood or something. Like that. Yeah, yeah. You put family in that. Like I've just found these weird things with Facebook that are I find frustrating. So, hmm. okay. Well, did we cut it there? I think we're going to cut it there. That's an hour. People <laughs> okay. are falling asleep by now. We're going to have to. We'll do a part two yeah. with uh, more specific strategies for uh, for tenant screening. But uh, I think we covered like you know the the biggest ones. Yeah. Right is the selection of the um, of the property and, and figuring out who your ideal tenant is. So um, yeah, why don't we wrap it up there and uh, we'll come back with part two of tenant screening. All right. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Two Stewards Show. If you like my voice better, click subscribe. And if you like my voice better, click share. If you like both, give us a five-star rating. To interact with the show, feel free to reach out at hello at twostewards.ca. We'll see you in the next episode. In the meantime, steward your wealth wisely.